Welcome to Community of Grace, this beautiful summer day here. Um, if you are able, please stand and join us in our gathering music, Oh God, You Are My God. We have done six weeks of the weird books of the Bible. Somehow we didn't do Leviticus in all of that, the weirdest one, but we did Revelation and Ruth. We did Ecclesiastes and Job. We did all kinds of fun, crazy books with weird circumstances that evoke something very human, that evoke these very human responses, normal emotions, normal lessons of our lives from really weird places. And if weirdness is ever relatable, then the place that that happens, oh, you're in for a treat the next five weeks because it's weird families. Um, there's one family in the Bible that is such a mess that I even feel normal. They, there's such a mess. These four generations are, so, and you think about it, You think about your, your parents and your grandkids or however that works, four generations. But these folks are so weird. Um, their great, great, great grandmother, she was a harlot who like, helped soldiers sneak in and destroy the government. That's a pretty awesome woman. That is a powerful woman right there. And then the, like, the great, 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 great granddaughter, well, she was this wild teenager who like, gets married, you know, before, you know, she's pregnant before she gets married. And then she goes and sings songs about ripping the rich people down from their thrones. I mean, so this family has got a lot of history, more skeletons probably than your family has. We're not going to have time for all the ancient ancestors and progeny because the four generations that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks, it's enough to see what God can do in the worst circumstances. I promise if you can make it here for these next few weeks, next Sundays in a row, I promise that God is going to show up even in your worst circumstances. You know, in my life, we've seen the movie, uh, we don't talk about Bruno, and there are things in your family that you want to keep hidden. There are things in your past that you want to keep pressed down but somewhere in there God even if God isn't cleaning all that up and like changing it God can use it for good God can shine light in the darkness God can bring hope in the chaos so we're um, I think we're gonna have a little bit of a musical interlude and then we'll get started with worship thank you <laughs>
Will you please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship? God who rests, we want more than a life exhausted. Help us to not apologize for our own healing. The fear we won't survive without overworking stalks us. Protect us from fear as we rest with you. As we with you. I am free to close my eyes.
I invite you to open your hands to receive God's message through our reading and praying. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may the Spirit of God rest upon us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. Amen. Scripture is from 1 Samuel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, the nation's leading judge and prophet, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have chosen one of his sons to be my king. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, and thought, surely this is the Lord anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesus told his son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shamia, but Samuel said, Neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for David. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Some of you might remember this song. I think I played this on my online interview with this church like a year and a half ago, as a a ways. How much of my mother has my mother left in me? How much of my love will be insane to some degree? And what about this feeling that I'm never good enough? Will it wash out in the water, or is it always in the blood? How much of my father am I destined to become? Will I dim the lights inside me just to satisfy someone? Will I let this woman kill me or do away with empty love? Will it wash out in the water, or is it always in the blood? I can feel the love I want. I can feel the love I need, but it's never going to come the way I am. Can I change it if I want it? I can rise above the flood. Will it wash out in the water, or is it always in the blood? How much like my brothers do my brothers want to be? Does a broken home become another broken family? Will it be there for each other like nobody ever could? Will it wash out in the water, or is it always in the blood? I can feel the love I want, I can feel the love I need, but it's never going to come the way I am. Can I change it if I want it? Can I rise above the flood? Will it wash out in the water? Or is it always in the blood? Will it wash out in the water? Or is it always in the blood? Okay, if any of the kids that want to come on up, you get to uh, come up here and embarrass your parents. How's that sound? 
That's the whole point of today is embarrassing the parents. All right, that's exciting. I'm glad you're here. You even brought your dad here to be embarrassed. That's great. Okay. So uh, uh, are you the oldest child in your family? No, I didn't think so. How many of you are the oldest child in your family? Okay. A lot of you grew up with a bunch of rules and responsibilities, and you focused on all those things. The oldest children, they don't tend to like to color or do art, and they don't really play well with others, which makes a lot of sense, church. Um, okay, so that's oldest children. How many of you are only children? There's like three of us in the whole building right now? Oh, my gosh. That was, I was an only child, and so there was no one to steal my toys, which was great, but it also probably made me neurotic, and you can ask your dad what neurotic means. Um, <laughs> is anyone here a middle child? Okay, a few of those. Middle children, you know, you get the, the things, some responsibility, some protection. It's good balance. A lot of the middle children in the world, they do, like, the biggest jobs, the most important. The, the corporate boardrooms are filled with second children. Prison also filled with second children. So, is that? <laughs> okay. So, you're, you're the youngest, though, right? Okay, who else is the youngest, like Annie? Only, okay, a few of you. A few of you are youngest. Um, being the youngest... I hear it can be really hard. I hear sometimes being the youngest can be hard because you're the smallest, and sometimes you get left behind. In the story we just read, there was big brothers that just kind of left their little brother behind. Parents are always doing such a good job with the youngest children, letting them learn on their own, but sometimes being the youngest means you feel lonely. Being the youngest means you want to fit in and count for something. So in the story that Miss Margie read, there was a boy, he was seven or eight years old. We don't know exactly, but something like seven or eight. He had the worst chores. Do you and your brother ever fight over what chores you get? No? Okay, well, that's worse. And your family has it worked out. I mean, I, chores are hard to decide when you're a kiddo. He would go on to be a king, and he would write songs and stories, and he would do some great things, and he would do some really bad things, too. But when he was seven or eight, just a, just a little boy, youngest child with the worst chores, he barely got to participate in anything. Something important happens in the house, he's not even invited. Now, I'm sure that his parents loved him. I'm certain of it. But I think he felt overlooked. And when this guy named Sam came to look for a king, they just thought David was too small to even count. But God did think of David. God often is looking for the people who feel the most left out in the world because God is in the business of loving us, especially when we feel the most unloved, especially when the world tells us we're not worth being loved. God says, no, nope, I'm going to choose that one on my team. So let's pray about that. Dear God, thank you for being there when we most need it all the time. Amen. All right. You can hang out with your parents, or I think Reed's going to study another story about another young person who made a big difference in the world. Okay, just to recap again. Great, great, great grandma. She was a tough one. Anyone who thinks the Bible is all about obedience and like that like women should just be obedient, this woman was like, no, 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 no. She persisted. And then great, 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 great granddaughter, anyone who thinks that women should just be subservient, they just aren't reading the Bible because this story, this family is about women who persisted and overcame. Amen? Okay, and now recap last week. Reed preached about Ruth. Thank you. I thank him for that. Very weird uh, book. There's only two books in the Bible that are named after women. Esther is out there, and Esther, you know, she's so powerful that when the government tries to take control over the bodies of her people, she gets the guy's head cut off. You know, not my idea. That's God's idea. You take it where you will. Um, but he preached about that one. He preached about the other one, Ruth, who's also pretty tough. She didn't take no for an answer. Uh, the fact that the book is named for a woman is kind of incredible in those days. But you, you remember where she's from? Does anyone remember where she, what country? Moab, not, not our Moab. Our Moab is named for their Moab. And Moab, for them, was this land. The Hebrews didn't really like the Moabites. It was, it was some, some conflict, some suspicion. They were, the, they were the other people. So she's not only a woman, but she's an other. And then, like, her husband dies. 
And at least in that culture, often there's this thing called victim blaming. And when people suffer, the world starts to blame those who are suffering for their own suffering. So they, they said, Ruth, it must be your fault that your husband died. And I'm sure you're aware, you listened last week, that she follows her mother-in-law, which was scandalous because there was no man to protect or to rule over them because women are property, right, right, right? So there's four layers of social stigma to the Ruth story, and the whole book is God's way of saying each of those layers are junk. They don't matter. They're stupid. Each of those layers, simple misogyny, misogyny, junk, xenophobia, junk, victim blaming, junk, male power, junk. So somewhere those ideas, some people thought they were normal. God says, no, those are weird ideas. The beloved community should be shaped differently. Now, you probably know because Reed told you that Ruth made it to Israel and eventually married a guy named Boaz. Now, I hope he didn't tell you how the whole courtship happened because it's, pretty, it's way worse than online dating, I, I promise you. Um, but for them, I would not recommend this to anybody, but for them it worked, and eventually they had a kid named Obed, and Obed had a kid named Jesse, and Jesse had a kid named David, and also other weird names that you... you, you you, no, you ran right through them. That's great. Anytime you're up here and there's a weird Hebrew name, just say it. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. I did terrible in Hebrew class, so I don't even know how to pronounce it. So that's your recap. That's what brings us to Jesse and David, the story that we just heard. So this week we're talking about Jesse's father, or David's father, Jesse. And what was David's mother's name? Hmm. Another woman left out of the story. You don't know her name because it wasn't mentioned in the Bible. Now, she's described a couple of times. David writes all these stories, and he does describe her, but not by name. But about 200 years after Jesus died, so this is a good way, long ways after, there was this Jewish sage named Hanan bar Rava. Anyone ever heard of that guy? Nope, none of you have. You, you, first time in church, you've been here every Sunday for 80 years. I, I'm almost certain you've never heard of Hanan Bar Rava. But this guy was incredible. He needs a movie about his life. In those days, the leading Jewish sages, see, they didn't have like one high court that everyone brought, like, oh, we have a, a conversation. Let's bring it to these people here and we'll get one interpretation that rules them all. No, in those days, all the top leaders gave their opinions and they were a little different at times. And over time, it became obvious which opinions were moral and holy and which ones were horse crap, okay? And so Hanan, his job, in his job, he was a spiritual shoveler of horse crap. He would say, well, this is just dumb. This is over here. Wouldn't that be great in America if our, you know, system would work like that? So that's what he did. And about 200 years after Jesus died, he wrote, for instance, a def the, the defining Jewish argument against pornography. Okay? You've never heard of him, but the Israel Supreme Court quoted him in 1997 when they were making some rules around really funky stuff. So that was one of the big things he did. Another big thing he did was a defining argument for disability rights. So in those days, people who were a little different, maybe they were an amputee or they had dwarfism, they were considered less than whole. They couldn't go into the temple. In fact, there was a rule at that time that if you were an amputee on the Sabbath, you weren't even allowed to take off your prosthetic. You had to leave it on because otherwise you weren't whole and God wouldn't love you. And so Hanan bar Rava said, horse crap to that, and he made a new, uh, a new policy. So this is a cool guy, and he's almost completely lost to history, except he's known for one other thing, and that is writing Midrash. Midrash is the Jewish genre of filling in the blanks. That's just what the word means. There's all these stories all through the Hebrew Bible. I mean, three quarters of our Bible is from the Hebrew Bible, and it just leaves so much of the story untold. And for these couple hundred years after Jesus, this was the rage. The holiest men and women would use their sanctified imaginations to prayerfully consider what was hiding between the lines. What was left out? Well, how was God still speaking even though the text was already on the page? So Midrash was not just for anyone to write. You couldn't just go and write your own Midrash, like, like fan fiction. You go online right now, you can find out anything you want to know about fan. You can, like, are all these great stories you read, like Lord of the Rings. Hmm, what happened in the Shire after Frodo left? 
Right? You can write that story. Someone can read it and enjoy it. In those days, it would be more like this. You want to wonder what happened in the Shire when Frodo left? You would reach out to George Lucas, and George Lucas would make a new trilogy about that. Or if you had an idea about, imagine a, someone wanted to write a documentary about Luke Skywalker. Well, they would say, Ken Burns, can you write that for us? That's what Midrash was in a holy kind of a way. And that's what Hanan bar Riva was doing. And his Midrash, his most famous rendering of the Hebrew stories, was about David and David's mother, Nitzavet. Nitzavet, it's my best pronunciation I've got. Her name means she stands up. What a cool name for a woman who isn't named in the Bible. She stands up. It's not really about her personality. It's about her becoming alive in the text and in the holy tradition. She stands up. Now, this is not, what I'm, the story I'm going to tell you is not from the Bible. This is this guy's sanctified imagination, which is sort of sub-scripture in Hebrew tradition. But what Margie read leaves a lot to be questioned. You know, why was David left out of the lineup to be king? Is it just this vague idea about birth order? You know, is it, is it because he's just little and kings have to be big and strong? If you've ever wondered, like, well, why did David stand up to a giant? That's an absurd idea for a 12-year-old to do. We don't want 12-year-olds to get into physical conflicts like that. What must have been on, going on in his head to do that? If you really read the thing closely, you see there's conflict with his brother when he stands up to a giant. Why did he write poetry? Why did he get scooped up into the arts? Why was he a great king in some ways, but still acted so badly in others? So if you've ever wondered about David's backstory, this is Hanan's idea from about 1,700 years ago that fits and tries to explain the blanks of the story Margie read. Okay, before David was a twinkle in anyone's eyes, Jesse and Nitzavet had been married for a good long time. They already had a bunch of sons. How many sons? Remember? Seven. You have seven sons, okay? Um, sh tell me, it... it is marriage hard work? Mm -hmm. Is parenting hard work? Okay, now imagine you're running a family farm with seven boys and God knows how many women. You're, you're, your husband and wife are just always there next to each other. The kids are getting in trouble with everything. Is your life easy? No. So after a while, let's say they've been married for 15, 20 years. Things get stressful. Uh, th those, those little arguments that, that we all have, and then we, you know, we cover them over and we apologize, but sometimes we don't apologize, and so that just gets just torn little by little apart. Some of the challenges they face bring them together. Some of the challenges pull them apart. And after 20 years, here they are growing apart. Everyone's so frustrated. It's hard to deal with. It's hard for dad. It's hard for mom. The kids know something is wrong because dad's in that house and mom's in that house. And, you know, you can try to hide it from the kids, but the kids always find out. They know what's going on. Jesse's so depressed because his whole sense of self is born up with, like, leading a family. Mom's so depressed because her sense of self is so wrapped up with, like, being loved and loving. The family is on edge. Everything is just teetering. If the family's going to be saved, we need a miracle. We need, a, we, need a, we need a Hail Mary, one last chance to fix it all. So Nitzavet tries something ridiculous, tries something weird. Frankly, it's just, it, it's insane. She tells her servant girl, go sleep with my husband. Huh? So it's kind of weird for us. In those days, it was kind of normal. It was kind of, it, it might have even happened. Hanan doesn't talk about it, but it might have actually happened already. But even so, her idea for a way to shake up all the bad feelings in the family and to start fresh was for her husband to go sleep with the servant. So Jesse's been, you know, he's been apart for his wife for a long time. Young servant girl comes in and says, you want, you want to do what? Yeah, you heard me right. When? Midnight. Where? The barn. How will I know it's you? I'm going to be wearing a big poofy hat. I'll be there. I'll be, it's going to be dark, but there's going to be a big poofy hat involved. If it works, nits of it thinks, then maybe Jesse will be happier, and maybe Jesse will get out of his depression, and maybe Jesse will treat the kids better, and maybe Jesse will remember how important she is because he saw another woman. Okay? You've all made terrible plans in your life, I know it, and you've thought them like that, but this is her option. This is her, we don't have to judge her. 
okay, what happens next? She made this plan. What do you think Nitsevit says to herself at like 11.30 p.m.? Cold feet? She says, I can't do it. I can't let this go through. So she goes over, she grabs a servant girl, says, get out of here. This is no, no. Can't bear to watch it happen. So right then, before Manette cover of darkness, she throws a servant girl out. She puts the poofy hat on herself. She hides in the barn. And what happens? Happens. Jesse doesn't know, though. Jesse thinks it was the servant girl. A few months later, he sees his wife pregnant. Well, he hasn't been with his wife for years. Oh, he's so angry. He's so mad. Now, he's not judging himself for the things that, that he might have done there, but he's so mad. He loses his mind. E even if they had been separated, even if he did what he did, even if all the rationalizations in the world, he's just so angry. Now, happy twist in this anger, sometimes anger can be productive, because in this case, in this story, it gets them back together. That situation brings them back to talk about their relationship through trauma, and they, they, they get back together. Not so happy twist, because it brings them back together, Nitzavet can't tell him what really happened. She can't tell him that she was the one that snuck in, or else maybe this delicate balance will fall apart. Really unhappy twist, she can't tell David what happened or who his birth father was. Really unhappy twist. How do you think Jesse treats that boy that he thinks is the product of his wife's affair? How do you think David grows up, how he relates to his mother and father, never quite knowing where he belongs? See how weird this family is? Four generations starting right here. You see why this young, the youngest son is seven or eight years old. All the, other, all the other boys, like 15, 16, 28. You see why he was off in the fields, relegated to the worst chores? Why, it's even, it's subtly in the text that, that, that Samuel comes and says, Jesse, I, do you have, where are the rest of your sons? And Jesse says, there's a boy in the fields. He doesn't say it's his son. He didn't include him. So you, underst you can understand then, three or four years later, all those brothers, all those big strong men, are out fighting the Philistines. David's stuck at home, the only boy left, stuck at home milking the goats, so he sneaks off. He sneaks off to hang out with his big brothers, to be tough. He actually brings them cheese. That's what the Bible says he does. He brings them cheese, and they ignore him as they've been doing their whole life. So the little boy gets mad, and he goes to me and says, I'm going to fight Goliath, and he does. It's the last straw. He's going to show them, big army guys. The big army guys, they know how to swords and wrestle and all that. All David has been doing, bored out of his mind with the worst chores, he's watching the sheep. So what happens, they don't have fences in those days. So when, like, you know, the sheep is, like, going off and, like, wandering, Jesse has a little slingshot, and he takes a rock, and he, like, throws it in front of the sheep, and the sheep's like, oh, i got to come back over here. And that's what he does all day, is, like, throwing slingshots in exactly the right spot just to keep these boring sheep to come back to the center of the field. And so even though all these big army men are great and strong, he can just whack this Goliath with his slingshot. Now you know maybe why this sad boy turned to music and to poetry and why he wrote about a God who would never leave because he always felt like his dad was absent. Now you might know why he talks about a God who will always protect him because he always felt so vulnerable at home. Now you know why he made these moral pledges. I mean, you read this through the Psalms, and he's like, oh, God, I'm, I'm never going to make a mistake. I'm especially not going to make mistakes like my parents made. You've all said that thing, right? And then he made some of the same mistakes with women, with his children, with his friends. So, so if you meet... Let's say you meet an eight-year-old boy who's carrying his parents' trauma like that. You just want to hug him. You just want to give him a safe place to be. You meet an 18-year-old boy who's still carrying that pain and acting out in pretty antisocial ways. Don't you just want to help him through it and kind of point him in the right direction? You meet a, like, 38- or 68-year-old king who is still hurting people because he's never healed from the hurt of his childhood, don't you want to, like, do something to help him show, like, find the light? You want to tell all of them, David, it's not your fault. Your past is not your fault. The things that happened before you were born are not your fault. 
It's not his fault how his parents treated him. His past does not define anything about his present, and neither does our past define our today. The pain we carry is not our whole story. The cycles we perpetuate do not have ultimate power over us. Now, it is David's responsibility for how he proceeds from that painful origin story. It is his responsibility for how he picks up the pieces and makes a new life. It is his responsibility to choose the values that enrich his life and his surroundings. And it is our responsibility, it's our opportunity, to do the same. It's our opportunity to grow and redeem and to challenge the scars that we carry. The past that has shaped and hurt us all does not say anything about what God has in store for us. The shame and loneliness and fear that is so deep-rooted. We all have these messages and these preconceptions. It, it, the part of adulthood is naming those and facing those. Sometimes we don't overcome them. At least we can see them. But that stuff is so close as though we, it, it, it's just part of us. But God's love is even closer. God's love for who we are, for what our soul is, that is so much more powerful than any of the accidents we fall into. God's love for who we can become is stronger than any of the mistakes that we make. This is how I heard it on Wednesday in the beginning of the Bible study. Speak to him thou, for he hears, and spirit with spirit can meet. Closer is he than breathing, and nearer than hands and feet. For all the ways that our lives have taken shape, and for the things that are beyond our control and what we wish we could control, for all of that, God's love is closer than the trauma that feels so stitched in our bones. And that is good news, and that may be transformative news. Amen. If you are able, please stand and join us in our responsive hymn, In an Age of Twisted Values. In an age of twisted values, we have lost the truth we need in so fit. Sophisticated language, we have justified our greed by our struggle for possessions. We have robbed the poor and we hear our cry and heal our nation. Your forgiveness, Lord, we see. Discrimination on our prejudice and fear. Hatred swiftly turns to cruelty if we hold resentments dear. For communities divided by the walls of class and race, hear our cry.
Okay, so we are at 2015 East Newcastle, kind of a little dot on the map. If you scan outward, you can barely see this tiny little, only a few of us in here, little, barely like we have any, like we, like we barely make a dent in the world, except last week we made burritos, and that went all the way uptown and helped people out. And, and the week before that, we were in the news across all of Salt Lake for dismantling weapons and turning them into garden tools. The week before that, we were part of the largest justice march in the state's history. The whole state got to see uh, us, along with a lot of other uh, churches and houses of worship at the Pride March. So it's, it's getting bigger. Our, our impact's getting bigger. But this week, uh, Tim and Dorothy are welcoming into their home a refugee family from Iraq. That's really far away. That's a, lot, uh, that's a longer impact. Some of you already work with a refugee family from Afghanistan. You know, if I had a, a globe, I could figure out which was actually farther, but I don't know which one's farther. They seem really far. Tom, right now, is in Vietnam working with children on medical missions. Tom, who's been on that piano for so long, is doing things that his career was for, for medical, and his faith was about using that, and somehow like, it gets connected all the way in Vietnam, this church. Mike got back, I think, last night. Last night, tonight? Is he getting back tonight? No, the planes are tomorrow. The plane, you can't even tell with the international date line that Mike's, a, Mike's in Tanzania, another really far away place where the impact of this church. Mike, I, I don't really understand what he does. Something to do with, like, engineering and legal and oil and gas and stuff that's beyond any of us. But his heart is also with these children in Tanzania. And somehow his career comes to this point where those two fit together, and he's able to advocate for justice for those young people <clears throat> through a new opportunity for jobs. 2015 East Newcastle, kind of a small church, might feel unassuming at times, but God has plans. And God is reaching our hands out. I think God is blessing this church to do good things around the world. And if that has ever affected you, if that has ever touched your heart, and if you think that we can continue God's blessing in this community and afar, you're always welcome to make a financial donation. We thank you. We thank God for leveraging that for good. And as we consider that, we hear our offertory.
Okay, in our time of prayer, let's be in that spirit, holding on to the names that are on your heart. God, sometimes I hate it when the rain comes pouring down, dark clouds piled up, and the gutters overflow. I hate it when I don't have control. But when the rain stops and the windows clear and I see a rainbow stretched across the sky, I remember your promise. I remember who is in control. Holy one, we need that rainbow today. At times, we find it hard to hold on to our hopes for ourselves, for members of our family, for the world where bad things seem to happen all the time. Help me when I'm depressed and hopeless. Help me to see a sign of your love for those who are doing worse. Raise our spirits so that we might be a blessing. For Kathy, whose dad, Hoagie, is still holding on to his memories. Be a blessing for Debbie Stevens, who lost her husband, Jim. Be a blessing for Rich and Sandy, who are both uh, recovering from their surgeries. Holy One, when you give me the patience and courage to carry on, I'm so thankful. When you replenish my energy and faith so that I can face what comes next, I'm grateful. When we see the dove showing us where dry land is, we come to you in gratitude. And this we pray together and with all creation through the words that you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And the peace of Christ be with all those who are watching online. And we say together, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we got, while, while uh, Grace is at her family reunion, good topic for uh, this week, you're going to lead us in amen, amen.